whether it's heat or cold, thermal banking is just storing the energy that's available for using at a time in the future. Looking at the energy that you have as your resource and that storage system as your, your savings account. Bringing the people behind our food to life. I, actually, I'm part of the back to the land movement from the 60s when we dreamed about living in harmony with nature and going beyond that, living also in harmony with the community around us. And so, um, you know, as well as uh, ecological principles, we had principles about cooperation and community. So with this farm, my goal was to develop a lifestyle that was in harmony with nature, within the cycles of nature. Uh, the farm itself, I thought, should produce the energy that it needed to produce the crops and to provide um, the necessities for the people that lived on that farm, which is easily done. We're in Minnesota. Uh, we have a limited amount of growing time, so many of the things that we grow uh, for our um, income are annual crops of vegetables that require greenhouse time to start the, the plants and um, you know, transplant them out into the fields during the summer. Greenhouses traditionally in the past were energy consumptive with the natural gas or fuel oil or even wood stoves that were required to keep them heated during that period of time in the winter. And a lot of greenhouses, all greenhouses actually, will get too hot even in, in the you know, late winter, early spring when the sun's shining and the days are getting longer will get so extremely hot that that heat, that solar gain is vented to the outside is wasted to the outside. So it was important for me to conserve and make use of the energy that was, that was available. Well, we've got all this energy, so what do we do with it? How do we trap it and save it? Part of the reason that my greenhouse gets so cold at night when the sun quits shining, because we have a cold floor. So why not use that hot air and heat the soil underneath and grow things in the winter? You know, that first greenhouse, I dug trenches about two feet deep and buried perforated drain tile and a big squirrel cage fan, blew that air down in and what I found was that um, it was a little too shallow and the soil dried out very fast and I had to constantly water. And it was all the, the fan was blowing from one end of the, the greenhouse and the end towards the fan was the hottest and the other end was the coolest. So the next stage was to build a, uh, another greenhouse that was a little bit better designed where I could have a better collection system that would collect from the peak of the greenhouse the hottest temperature air and blow it down and divide it, divide the greenhouse in half and blow it through U-shaped tubes to the outside. Sarah granted us $5,000 to start on that study. That project actually cost me about um, probably 40 more thousand dollars when we figure materials, uh, more if we figure the labor in. A good share of our materials were, were purchased through grant money so that we could afford to purchase solar voltaics, solar panels, hire a backhoe and purchase materials and glazings for this greenhouse and then we supplied all the labor and the rest of the materials. This greenhouse was designed with one uh, long pitched uh, roof, glazed roof, uh, and the, the intention was that as the hot air rised and hit that roof it would naturally uh, force the hottest air up into this ridge area that is three feet by four feet 
Uh, you can see an end view here of the collection tube that runs the length of that ridge. It has an inlet every 10 feet, so I can collect hot air uh, and pull it down through this 10-inch um, uh, painted black galvanized pipe that goes into the fan unit and then blows down into the beds. A lot of greenhouses, commercial greenhouses, are oriented north-south. As the sun travels, it goes over the greenhouse. Ours is oriented east-west because for us it was important to catch and conserve the maximum amount of energy. So we wanted maximum solar gain in the winter time when the sun is low. The uh, underground thermal storage with the greenhouse was probably at least a third of the total time involved in construction of the greenhouse. You know, when people see the greenhouse, all they see is what's above ground. But digging the three foot deep by four to five foot wide trenches was a major undertaking. We hired a backhoe to dig out the trenches, but then we had to square them and clean them all by hand with a shovel. We hauled the smooth one inch plus river rock with a wheelbarrow and dumped it into the trenches and laid our, our perforated drain tile on top of that and then buried that in more one inch plus rock. We used up a lot of our old row cover, all this row cover that is garbage, you know, when you get done using it, it's got holes, it's dirty had no other use. It was a perfect use for uh, covering the top of that, that rock so that our, our bed mix uh, wouldn't filter down through and, and uh, ruin our storage system. Then we laid in-floor radiant tubing on top of that reme, on top of that row cover, and buried it. We mixed the topsoil with composted uh, manures from our various uh, livestock and peat moss and sand so that we'd have a, a bed soil that, that air could percolate through and that water could percolate through and wouldn't become, would stay biologically active. That was the bed system. We, we put in place monitors. Um, uh, we have tubes uh, of four inch PVC that come up from that perforated drain tile. We put T's in and put monitoring tubes up on the ends of the beds and in the middle of the beds where we can uh, put an, uh, an indoor-outdoor thermometer probe down into the gravel bed to monitor the temperatures down there. And uh, then using soil thermometers, uh, six inch length ones and compost thermometers that go 20 inches deep to monitor the temperatures in the bed soil. So we can keep track and understand how, how the, what the flow pattern is for the, the solar gain that we're blowing into the beds and you know, what, you know what temperatures we're working with down underneath, what the most efficient timing is to start that fan, blowing that heat down in there. You know, initially it was a very simple um, control system. We, when the sun shined, the fan was hooked up with a variable speed, variable current, uh, half horse, um, direct current motor. The sun shined, the motor started up slow, and as it got hotter during the day, as the sun shined brighter, the motor went faster. We're seeing perfect. The problem is, is the sun shines before the air in the top of the greenhouse gets hot. So the first hour we were blowing cold air down into those beds and then it took a whole nother hour to compensate for that cold air that we blew down in there. So we, need, we needed to put a thermostat up in the ridge of the greenhouse so that that fan would not come on until that air had warmed up above the soil temp the temperature in the gravel storage underneath. Initially when I did the grant, I figured um, 
estimated what the cost of energy was going to be. And the cost of the greenhouse initially equaled the cost of the energy that I was going to spend in about 10 to 12 years. So if the greenhouse lasted 20 years, then that whole last 10 to 12 years would be a net profit above what the profit would be if I would have done it conventionally with using fossil fuels. For another farmer, looking at what we've experimented and, and learned from this greenhouse project, there are a lot of things, parts of it, that could be applied in a lot of different ways to other operations. If someone has an existing greenhouse that they're using LP gas or oil to heat and they haven't built permanent structures or poured a cement floor or anything in it, they could very easily trench that and you know, do a vent collection tube uh, in the peak of that greenhouse and try and conserve that heat that they're venting right now into the floor of the greenhouse and have a warm floor that would radiate, and, uh, radiate heat and keep that greenhouse warm during the day. We've been marketing since the first part of May, which in Minnesota you would not have tomatoes, cucumbers, basil, peppers available this time of year. So we, we plant those in that greenhouse in February. We plant them at the same time that we are finishing harvest on what was planted the previous fall in November or December. Through the winter when it's cold, when it's really cold, and it can actually freeze and frost in that greenhouse, we grow salad mix, uh, cilantro, dill, beets, scallions, carrots, parsley, things that can handle the cold. We definitely have uh, you know, benefited economically by having peppers that are red and yellow and orange and chocolate colored to sell when all those other ones coming in from Holland are outrageously high priced. It, you know, it raises the price that we get too, much more than uh, when we're selling them in the middle of the season when several other you know, vendors have them. And let me explain a little bit further. I look at profits as, with dollar signs, as only being a very crude measure of the success of your farm or your efforts. Because your profits are in the health of your family, the integrity of your family's relationship to the community. I mean, those are the profits that we forget to measure. You know, maybe it's the 60s thing, but uh, in, in the end, we all have to look at our journey on this earth as being connected with our community and, and start to dissolve the separateness between us and the rest of the community and the separateness of us from the land. We're not battling the land. We're learning to dance with it and work with it. This video has been made possible with funding from Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, SARE.